Renewable energy credits are a little different. Renewable energy credit is, is that, uh, let's say that Bill and Bob own businesses right next to each other. And Bill says, you know what? This, this green is a bunch of garbage, you know. I've done my business this way for 30 years, and I'm not remotely interested in changing this. This is just a burble in the system. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to keep on going the way I'm going. Bob, on the other hand, says, I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that the earth is around for my kids. So he goes to the utility company and says, I want to buy renewable energy credits. So they surcharge his, uh, his uh, electric bill. And they give the money to him who's running a wind farm generating <laughs> energy, right? Now, what's the nice thing about it? Bob can say, my business is run on renewable energy. But the wires go into the, you know, the same wires go into both businesses. How can uh, Bill not be and Bob can be? Well, it's a mathematics exercise, okay? That's basically what it boils down to. But the essential point is, is he's getting the money to generate more electricity, okay? And, and that's the main difference between buying forgiveness and actually contributing. Now, what do the guys do with the money once they get it in Chicago? They're supposed to give it to him, too. Be very, very careful about buying carbon credits because there's some investigations going on. It's like the old um, nonprofits. You got to check out the nonprofits to see where the money's actually going. Okay, let's continue on. Carbon sequestration. That's basically hiding your sins. We're burying the carbons in, in different places. A carbon sink. Now, if you've ever dealt with a heat sink and you have one on your computer, it's the thing that attracts the heat from your central processing unit. Uh, carbon sinks are natural occurrences of places that carbon go, okay? And the two are oceans and trees and vegetation. Net energy, excuse me, net zero energy building. Does anybody recognize this picture? That is the Pearl River Project in China. It's a 72-story office building, net zero. The architectural firm that is responsible for this building is SOM out of Chicago. Okay, there's a lot of press, and if you Google uh, China, China River, excuse me, if you, Pearl River in China, you'll see this. Now, what's neat about this is you see these two tuck points. It's hard to see on here, but there's two tuck points, and what that happens is, is that wind comes in through those tuck points, hits some wind generators, excuse me, generators, and they provide electricity for the 72-story building, office building, okay? It also provides air changes. So I, I like to say this, being a, an engineer, I like to say that this is a building where the architects decided they were going to call us before they designed it, instead of thinking, who did we forget to get a hold of? Oh, yeah, the HVAC guys and the plumbing guys. Yeah, let somebody call them, okay? Tell them this is what we got to have, and we need it tomorrow. But I think this is going to become the future. I really do, where everybody puts their heads together before we get rolling. Okay, brownfield. Th that's a term that basically means that it's land that's been used before that could either be possibly affected or is affected by pollution or contamination. My rule of thumb is as if the business was in business uh, 1940, 1950, when we were not socially aware, you, you gotta take a look at possible contamination. Brownfield gets extra points for lead, so you're gonna probably see a lot more of these brownfield projects. Biomimicry, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. It's where we steal ideas from uh, nature. One of uh, the most simplest examples of biomimicry, besides tree leaves and solar cells, is Velcro. Anybody ever had uh, those seeds attach themselves to their socks when they're walking along? Remember the, when Velcro first came out, it had little hooks on it. Now it doesn't. But see the similarities? Ceramics that are resistant to breakage were patterned after Mother of Pearl. Mercedes-Benz went out and started uh, looking for a biological 
uh, sample that they could base a new car that was aerodynamic on. And believe it or not, after doing all kinds of checks and samples, they came along, uh, along the box fish as being the most aerodynamic example in, in uh, nature that they could find. And the thing looks like a box with fins on it. But the numbers are unbelievable. We all hear about ozone, but there's two kinds of ozone. Any of you guys that are into refrigeration know that when you have refrigerant leaks, you create ozone. So the question was posed to me, if that's true, why don't we just release a bunch of refrigerant, let it create ozone, and let it rise up and plug the holes? Well, there's good ozone and there's bad ozone. It's sort of like cholesterol, okay? Cradle to cradle. Cradle to cradle is something that you can reuse over and over again. A good example of cradle to cradle application is a brick. If I build a house for him, or excuse me, deconstruct a house for him and I'm going to build one for myself and I take the brick from his house and I put it into my house, that's cradle to cradle. Okay? Now let's talk about cradle to grave. Cradle to grave means that you don't use up the whole resource and you don't try to recycle it or reuse it. A good example of cradle to grave is flashlights. Anybody ever had a flashlight that there was still a charge on it but you were going to go camping or you were going to go do a job and you needed to make sure that the flashlight didn't fail on you, so you took the batteries out, you threw them away, put in a fresh set, and off you go. You didn't even think about it. That's cradle to grave. 